1945, the course of the observatory's work would change forever. With its dome and library in flames, the loss of its 19-inch telescope, the stacks of unpublished data gathered by 200 observers and 10,000 volumes of books, Father Selga wrote these words to describe what had been lost. No longer the director of the observatory, the wartime master of novices could not, however, have foreseen the magnitude of the changes that were to come. While the destruction of the observatory was a great blow for the Jesuits and their companions, the human and economic losses from both the violence of war and liberation set to give rise to a new nation whose new directions would at times challenge its mission. The war not only destroyed the observatory buildings and instruments in Manila and the 75 years worth of data it served as the foundation for MO's scientific work. It also ushered in a republic. And under this post-war administration, the creation of a new National Weather Agency. The Second World War marked the transformation of the Manila Observatory's mission from being an operational agency of the government into a scientific institution dedicated to basic research in the frontiers of science. This began with the confinement of the American Jesuits at the University of Santo Tomas and the gradual decline of communications from its secondary stations in Baguio, Ambulong, Antipolo, Butuan, and Tagaytay. Eventually, the loss of control over its 370 weather stations all over the country drove the Society of Jesus and the community of Jesuit scientists into a period of deep reflection and action. After six years of discernment, major transitions took place at the Manila Observatory. It was in 1951, under the charge of Father Charles Depperman of the Society of Jesus, that it resumed its scientific research at Mirador Hill in Baguio. The renewed observatory now a private institution focused on the movements below the ground, earthquakes, and weather in the upper atmosphere, space weather. Along with space weather, the interactions of the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, and the heliosphere, and how they are all affected by the sun, the main driver of the Earth's weather and climate, emerged as new research priorities. The country's latitudinal and longitudinal location within the magnetic equator and the Pacific Ring of Fire meant unique geophysical data that would not have been possible from other parts of the Earth. And these new research directions were at the frontiers during those times. Russia launched its Sputnik satellite only in 1957, and the plate tectonic theory was firmly established only in 1965. At a time when man was starting to venture into outer space, the observatory was strategically positioned to provide valuable scientific data to further our understanding of the upper atmosphere. By 1957, the Manila Observatory was studying ionospheric storms, imaging sunspots and solar flares, and recording earthquakes and earth tides. It joined more than 60 other countries in the observation of the International Geophysical Year, an international collaboration aimed at advancing scientific knowledge in such fields as geomagnetism, ionospheric physics, seismology, and solar studies. As their contributions to the IGY, Father Francisco Glover published his work on radio physics in the Journal of Geophysical Research in 1963, and Father James J. Hennessy published several articles including The Cat's Whiskers in 1956 and Moonwatch on Mirador in 1958. The Cat's Whiskers refer to the very sensitive set of seismometers 
that were used by the observatory as part of the network of stations involved in the Pacific Seismic Sea Wave Warning System. Moonwatch and Mirador describe the Manila Observatory's involvement in the visual observations of the Sputnik and Explorer satellites, the first two satellites launched into space. Aside from his regular study of the Sun for the IGY, Father Richard Miller was called upon extra duty to compute the times of passage of satellites over Mirador. Those computations were important for the sightings of the satellites, as there were very few ground-based observing stations in this part of the world. New partnerships were critical to the rebirth of the Manila Observatory. Scientific studies in solar and ionospheric research were made possible in part by strategic collaborations between the observatory and reputable scientific institutions such as the U.S. Bureau of Standards, now known as the U.S. National Institute of Science and Technology, and the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. After 10 years in Baguio, Father Hennessy led the community back to Manila in an effort to once again bring it closer to the university environment. Spurred by the need to expand its solar studies, the observatory opened the new doors of the solar building on the Ateneo de Manila campus in Loyola Heights, Quezon City, in 1963. On this land, near the Marikina Fault, they finally had enough space for four buildings of solid concrete, the main building and the ionosphere, seismic, and solar research buildings. This last one was to house the expanding solar studies program of the Manila Observatory. The solar building would pique the interest of all because of its fascinating circular structure, which was designed around a spectroheliograph, which could produce high-quality solar images. The instrument was built through the first of the now many collaborations between the Manila Observatory and NASA. With the addition of new Jesuits like Father Richard Miller, for solar physics, Father Sergio Su for seismology, and the return of the world-renowned astronomer Father Francis Haydn, the observatory's Jesuit scientific tradition was assured for another lifetime. To train the next generation of physicists, the observatory Jesuits also established the Department of Physics in the Ateneo de Manila University in 1963. For the next 25 years, the Jesuits divided their work according to three divisions. The first was the Seismology Division that monitored and studied seismic activities associated with earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, as well as observations for typhoons and sea waves. Strong, destructive earthquakes were recorded by the observatory, including the 1968 Kasiguran earthquake that was analyzed and later reported by Father Sergio Su in the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America. This event affected Manila heavily and was grimly remembered as the one that caused the collapse of the Ruby Tower. The Manila Observatory was also a volunteer member of the Seismic Sea Wave Warning System of the Pacific, which gave timely warnings to those in danger from seismic sea waves or tsunamis that follow severe undersea tremors. To better understand tsunamis, so that steps may be taken to lessen loss of lives and properties, Father Vic Badilio wrote a detailed technical report of the 1976 Moro Gulf tsunami, which left 8,000 people dead or missing, 10,000 injured, and 90,000 homeless in its wake. The second division was the Upper Atmosphere Division that deployed ion suns, VLF receivers, and magnetometers for monitoring the magnetosphere and ionosphere, which in the words of Father Hennessy, exist as a shield to absorb solar and cosmic radiation harmful to the life of the human race. With Father Hennessy and Father Vic Badilio, ionospheric soundings were recorded on reels to study the activities of the upper atmosphere, as well as the connection between the atmosphere and the sun. Monitoring the upper atmosphere was essential for radio communications and is still relevant to this day because of the dependence of modern society on electricity and satellite communication. The third was the Solar Division, headed by Father Richard Miller and later by Father Francis Haydn, 
which utilized the spectroheliograph and sun telescope for imaging sunspots, solar flares, and solar magnetic fields. Solar activity affects the Earth's climate as well as modern infrastructure like communications and power plants. In 1971, Father Haydn returned to the observatory to direct the solar division for another 20 years where he and his team sent regular reports on solar activity to the U.S. Air Force. It became less evident that the Manila Observatory was serving the direct needs of the Filipino people, but the Jesuits continued with this renewal of their mission in response to what they saw as the real needs of the time. From surviving a time of turmoil to going through a complete change in its official mandate, the post-war period had led the Manila Observatory through momentous transitions that paved the way for its current fields of research. While the specific fields of scientific research may have changed, the observatory remained truthful to its mission of serving the Filipino people in the name of faith and science.